Welcome to the Three Things Podcast. I'm David Iglesias, Director of Wheaton Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics. You may be wondering why this podcast is called Three Things. You were probably taught by your parents, like I was, that it was impolite to talk to people about three things, religion, politics, and money. But what happens if your job is to talk about those three things? Well, join me for the next 25 minutes and let's find out. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Young to the listening audience. I have heard about Dr. Young for years. My mentor, Bob Bartell, was an econ professor here for many years, and he spoke rapturously about Dr. Young. And I never thought I would have a chance to meet him. Well, here you are, uh, in the real flesh. So it's good to be back, your class of 1959. I'm wondering if you could tell us uh, how it was you came to Wheaton College. Wow. Big question, but it boils down to um, a first-generation American. My father came from Belfast in 1927. Uh, no one in the family had gone to university, so he didn't really have much of a picture of where one would go, but he was very serious about his faith, Presbyterian, coming out of Northern Ireland. And... Um, a young man in our church had come to Wheaton, and my dad thought that would be a good place for me to go. And I think gradually it just seemed to be a natural pick. And in a way, just walking around yesterday, I realized how fortunate I was with no kind of support system at all to show up here in 1955 from a small town in upstate New York, Fishkill, New York, uh, in the middle of the Midwest. And it was a very happy four years, no attentions at all, just uh, I think my main um, asset was just hard work. And uh, I just worked as hard as I could. I majored in physics and had uh-huh. wonderful professors. And But the man who really uh, uh, kind of opened up the world to me was the literature professor, Clyde Kilby. Oh, of course, yes. And, uh, and then when we wound up going back, uh, I then went to Cornell Law School and then to Oxford to read law. Uh, Kilby was always wanting me to uh, uh, go and buy uh, C.S. Lewis's home, which I couldn't afford, but uh, became a pretty part of our life. Well, that would explain why Bob Bartell holds you in high regard, because <laughs> Bob was the one who bought the the wardrobe, the famous right? wardrobe from the Kellens. Yes, he's got a great story about that. So how does a physics major go to law school? It seems oh, like I, those are two different uh, yeah. languages. I think um, I can't really explain it other than um, I felt that law gave me the biggest... Uh, spectrum of options which one could have, say, in their toolkit. Mm-hmm. wasn't that I was crazy about physics or crazy about law. I was just saying, you know, what gives me uh, the kind of greatest number of options to build with? And uh, I also uh, had this thing about trying to understand the world mm-hmm. and, uh, yeah, that, that probably it. The, the whole separate, separate chapter of my life, because when I finished Oxford in 1965, I hitchhiked to Calcutta from oh London. Oh, it took about eight months, <laughs> and uh, my old aunt just gave me a clipping that I had written a letter to my local newspaper in Beacon, New York, from Calcutta in 19, August 25th, 1965. And I start out by saying that maybe some of you remember me as your paper boy and as your postman at Christmas, and I thought you may like to know what I've been doing for the last six months, four months, and now I have still six months, four months to go before I get back home. And I told them what it was like going over the Hindu Kush and the oh water tanker. And the thing that's kind of sad is you could never do that. That's I mean, right. You can't do that. Now, and yeah. yet at that time, I was all alone, but I never had any fear at all. 
Uh, the, the world has changed for the worse in that regard. So I should have stated earlier that uh, Dr. Young is also known for a variety of things, starting Oxford Analytica and also uh, working uh, as a special assistant to Henry Kissinger when Dr. Kissinger was the national security advisor during the Nixon administration. So that begs the next question, sir. How did you get into politics? You had a physics background, you went to Oxford, and you come back and get into, into American politics yeah. during the turbulent late 1960s. Yeah, that's right. Well, okay, I'll do this as fast as I can. Um, so from weekend, actually, I'm in the ROTC, mm -hmm. and I kept going in in January of 1960, so I had that six months, and I decided to work on a Norwegian tanker, freighter, back and forth between Latin America and Canada and the U.S. and into Europe. Well, I then get to Europe and uh, have my first trip to Europe, come back and do six months in the, in the ROTC, then start Cornell Law School a year. I didn't like law school at all, so I got to deal with Cornell. I could go to Oxford. Very nice. They would give me a year credit if I got a good Oxford degree, and then I did that and came back and did one more year. So not having been in love with law school, I wound up doing <laughs> four years instead of three. And after law school, uh -huh. I make this trip uh, after Oxford. That's the beginning of, of 1965. And I start Millbank Tweed in New York, the big law firm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I got to know uh, some of the uh, people there from my time at Oxford, and did four years, 65, 69. In 1968... As a lawyer? As a lawyer. Okay. On one Chase Manhattan Plaza. And the senior partner is a man named John J. McCloy, who was one of the wise men in the book, The Wise Men. Uh, and uh, he... Uh, there was always this sense of public service. And the Rockefeller family were clients of the firm, and they seconded one young lawyer to the family each year. And I got uh, selected for that in 68, and wound up actually treasurer of Rockefeller for president, met Kissinger, and I said to Kissinger when he got selected as national security advisor, if, uh, if I can ever be of help, I'd love to come down and work for you. And so that's how it happened. He asked me to come down at the end of 69, and I then spent the next four years as his first personal administrative assistant, then special assistant, then a variety of other projects. So were you working then uh, at in the Eisenhower building, the old executive office building? Well, mainly I was in the West Wing, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and then eventually in the different projects when I had a separate office and a couple of staff, I was in the old EOB. Yeah. I see. Uh, what, what kinds of projects uh, did you do for Dr. Kissinger? Well, as his administrative assistant, you were really the uh, keeper of the paper flow and the, and the, and the uh, uh, control of his time. That would be the core of the job. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of the time was uh, uh, being the third person in the room to make a record of what was being done. And what was being said, so you had, you knew what had to, you had to do to follow up and so forth. So that was the core of it, it and it ranged in from there on, everything from uh, the cabinet committee to combat terrorism in the wake of the uh, Munich Olympic killings, oh, yes. Yes, um, yes. Uh, a big project on declassification, which we overhauled the classification system. Uh, and always in pretty um, significant meetings. I, I was kind of the link that's become notorious now, but everything was um, uh, uh, controlled out of the West Wing, mm -hmm. and that was both the plus and minus of uh, the uh, so-called Nixon Kissinger secrecy. So you pull everything in so you control it, in the West Wing, and uh, you have these back channels, and whether it's on the strategic arms talks or the opening to China, or on Vietnam, or in the Middle East, um, and they um, 
they, they kind of take up, you know, three quarters of the time right. running that right. job. So what's the greatest lesson you learned from Henry Kissinger? Oh, boy. I know there are probably many, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you to just identify one. Well, I suppose um, whatever you're asked to do, you know, do it, you know, the very best of your ability. And also um, the the significance and the kind of essential nature of trust and uh, in any relationship like that. And um, it is, it's hard to single it down. And, and the kind of, I don't want to say obsession, but the preoccupation, mm -hmm. well, the flip side of that would be uh, the... Um, uh, preoccupation with quality, 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 quality. You know, is this the best you can do? Is this the best you can do? Is this the best you can do? So that's kind of beat into you. And and the trust side uh, was also critical as well. So uh, you were there, obviously, when President Nixon was there. How much interaction did you did you have with President Nixon? Well, maybe you'd see him all the time. He'd, he'd be coming back and forth. But not much direct, except in a few specific uh, kind of major instances. But uh, the um, <clears throat> main thing was like 7 by 24 with Kissinger and his immediate staff, which was about um, three or four people. And that was the core in the West Wing. The NSC then was about 35 professionals. That's it? They, they, were in the, they were in the old EOB. I understand today it's over three, 300. That's, that's, that's and, large, uh, quite large. Yeah. It shows you with the right quality what you can actually run and, and, and what can be done. Because everything was done with that, 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 that group of 35 mm -hmm. people. Uh, when did you first realize there was a problem in the Nixon administration? Well, I suppose... It's interesting to question it that way. There, there is a parallel, I would say. You know, every young person showing up in the White House, I was 33, um, you, you know, every kid going back a couple hundred years who shows up at 33 in the White House to say, there's a problem here. I mean, um, one of the great lines before I went to Washington, I went to see Mr. McCloy, senior partner in the law firm, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, he said, when the White House calls, you go and you serve your country, correct? To just remember, David, there'll be a lot of intrigue in the palace when you get that close to the throne, which is an amazing way to yes. picture what you're up against. Yes. And he, he probably... That brings in a big lesson, which was I showed up assuming everybody's on the same page, everybody's trying to get the same, the same goal. Mm -hmm. And then you realize everybody has their own ego, and a lot of that then leads to differences in how you're going to go about getting things done, because it's all a game of getting credit and shifting blame. Yes. And... You run that through and do, and it's not only they're all on a different, well, maybe not all, but there, there's several different goals being sought. Everybody is doing wanting to do it their own way, and they don't want you to get your way. And so the amount of uh, sense of battle, I think I said in the article I sent you. Yes. Um, that probably the biggest takeaway, and that could even be back to your question on the lesson, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, is that the sense of battle, it's just continuous battle. Right, and, and, I, and I see your point that presidents always have problems, and Nixon always had problems as well. But was there a point in which you realized this is a fatal problem, that this is going to cause the administration to actually uh, end prematurely? No, I don't think I ever... Uh, 
ever f felt that or sensed that um, until, you know, it was obvious at the end. But um, you wondered, in, in looking back, to, you know, not just this playhouse, but at number 10 Downing Street and the Elysee in Paris and, mm -hmm. and the Kremlin. Every one of these uh, concentrations of political power is, is there's a big similarity in the degree to which there is the infighting, and it's a trade-off often between a pursuit of national interest and a pursuit of personal interest. Yes. And that probably kind of is the framework over which everything else happens. So I was struck by your, your speech at Yale uh, in the year 2000, um, and you said something that really um, fired up my imagination. And that was something to the effect of, if I, sitting in the West Wing, would open up the ceilings, I would see an enormous spiritual battle going on around me. Uh, I've read a lot of books from a lot of people um, in the political realm. I've never seen it put in such starkly spiritual terms. I'm wondering if you can maybe explain that, uh, oh. that a little bit more. I mean, um, when I first wrote that, I thought, boy, everybody think they're gone crackers. But then, <laughs> you know, since then, um, um, along came uh, Tolkien, Lord of the Rings. Yes. And uh, they got it in living color. Um, that is people's imagination. And actually, if you go back throughout history, great art, bleak, people trying to picture heavenly battles or Dante's Inferno and great literature trying to picture battles between good and evil. And in some days you just felt it was such an intense battle. You know, if you had the eyesight of... Uh, Elijah, Elijah and his servant, you would have seen these battles in the heavens. So that, um, that actually, as far out as it seemed, the person that came to my rescue with a fabulous explanation is Robert S. McNamara, Kennedy's mm -hmm. Secretary mm -hmm. of Defense and first head of the World Bank, great friend of Kissinger at the time. <clears throat> His documentary, Fog of War, is 11 yes. Lessons from the uh, Life of Robert McNamara. Three of his 11 lessons had to do with hard power. That's the framework I've set up in both of these papers. And McNamara had set up. There's hard power. We all know what that is. There's soft power. Joe Nye's written a lot about that. And there's a third dimension. You can call it whatever you want. You can just say it's the non-hard, non-soft yes. dimension of power. So McNamara as three have to do with hard power, mm. three have to do with soft power, and five are neither hard nor soft, right? right? And I said, well, that fits into my category. Rationality will not save us. Yes. Right? You can't change human nature. Right. Right? And as Christians, we, we, we believe that human nature is deeply exactly. flawed, exactly. that, that, that exactly. there is original sin. Right. And the founding principle of our firm, when I went back to Oxford, and he asked me earlier, and as we cover it now, is uh, how did Oxford Analytica come out of the time in the White House? Yes. <clears throat> in a nutshell, I watched Kissinger in the middle of the night often calling friends around the world. That was one of his great strengths was his network of friends around the world and working through issues. And oh, I thought, my gosh, when I arrived back in Oxford, it was a whole town of Henry's second opinion guys. Mm -hmm. And some of them I'd call from the White House, the most famous one being the man named Alistair Buchan, who founded the Institute for Strategic Studies, who was a great oh, sure. friend, friend of Henry's. So that kind of uh, leaping over to get to people who had expertise outside and no ax to grind. Mm -hmm. They were the people you, you were wanting to get to. And in setting up the firm, I said, well, we have to start from the basics, which actually McNamara came along after that and said you can't change human nature. Our founding principle, the first one, is uh, scholarship is the pursuit of truth, and it begins with the correct assessment of human nature. 
Yeah, that's, that's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So, so could you have started a, a firm similar to Oxford Analytica in the United States at, yeah, at that time? Yeah, and uh, my old boss at Milbank, Mr. Dilworth, Dave Dil- Richardson Dilworth, who was at the Rockefeller family offices, he wanted me to come back and do it at Yale because King Wynne Brewster was the president of Yale and was a great friend. Mm-hmm. So why are you starting this in England and not in America? Yes. Well, the big advantage, actually, of Oxford was the five-hour jump on the American market. Ah, yes. So every day that we download now for 35 years, plus um, if we download by 1 o'clock, 1.30, it's 8.30 in the uh, trading rooms of Wall Street. That, that makes perfect sense from a business perspective. I just wanted to ask you another couple of questions about uh, some things you, you wrote in your, uh, in your Yale speech. You, you talk about um, that the underlying pessimism and anger and extraordinary turmoil from that era. You talk about uh, the social cohesion of America was strained. Uh, and sometimes I hear people say now that this is the most America has been divided. And I'm just wondering if you could uh, compare those times in the late 60s and with what's going on right now. First of all, the general statement of this is why history is so important. Even then, I don't think I didn't have a grasp of what America had gone through the previous 200 years, right? Mm -hmm. And you read about uh, the 1800s, you read about uh, just recently about uh, Buchanan is elected in 1856. Right. He's the most qualified guy in the country. He's going to save the Union, right? But yeah. doesn't have the character right. that Lincoln has shows up. So Buchanan's at loss, and Lincoln shows up. And it's almost like cometh the time, cometh the man. But it, it's all all built around character. We were talking earlier. Yes. Character is shaped by power, and some people <clears throat> rise to the occasion, have the vision and the character, and know mm-hmm. what's right from wrong, in the sense of uh, <clears throat> having a, mor- a moral compass. And uh, I think that today there have been hard times before, and the more we know about history, we know how hard the times were, though I don't want to minimize how hard a time it is now. And it could be, Kissinger's quoted with saying, uh, this period may be a change of direction in the trajectory of America. I said to a friend the other day, it's as if we've lived through the golden age of America and not known it, because actually in 1895, Bismarck is asked, what's the future of the international world? And he says, it's America. And because they speak English, and he saw America's rise. And basically, Time Magazine, everybody called it the American century. That's right, yeah. yes. And, yeah, it was our century. And, uh, you know, America, Pax America, did prevail. Now we're in the middle of a kind of reevaluation of what that meant and what it could mean going forward and whether it will be reestablished, et cetera. I have to tell you, I, I think we're we're running short on time, so just a couple more questions. I wish I could have you for a series of uh, podcasts because uh, I've just scratched the surface. Uh, your experience is, is so rich. But um, you, you, in your Yale speech, you talk about uh, Kennedy administration uh, speechwriter Theodore Sorensen, who wrote some of the most iconic things any American president uh, uttered during the 20th century. Uh, but you talk about him... Um, talking about available information, uh, which at the time, in the early 60s, inf- information was limited. In the era of the Internet, it's, it's virtually unlimited. I'm wondering how, in your view, uh, the fact that there is enormous amounts of information available to the ordinary citizen, how does that change how yeah. politicians view information? Well, there's the a great couple of lines from a poet. Where is the... Uh, Wisdom, we've lost the knowledge. Where's the knowledge that we've lost the information? And you could say, where's the information we've lost in this waterfall, ubiquity of information? I don't know how it all fits, but it's something people have coped with 
for generations, for decades, right? And I do think it's more difficult. Yes, a lot of people say, well, AI, artificial intelligence, come in to save us on this. And to some extent, it may be part of the thing that uh, copes on that. I thought you were going to ask me about Schwartz and then the other thing that he didn't feel about the press being one of the constraints. That, that's right. Well, in fact, that, 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 thank you, because that's my other Sarsen question. <laughs> but the answer to your point yes. is that <laughs> you just have to look at the movie um, The Post to show how Sorensen wasn't worried about the press because Bradley and Kennedy were such great friends, right? right? They were buddy-buddy. They, they, they didn't have the, quite the problem with the press on them that other presidents before and after had. That's not to say that that yes. Kennedy got a free ride, but it's a very interesting contrast to look at those two different things. And I'll stop there. And, and, and just so the audience is clear, Ben Bradley was the editor of the Washington Post when, yeah. when President Kennedy was yeah. in office. Okay. Yeah, you don't see that sort of uh, collegiality anymore. Final question um, is, uh, I'm just wondering if you could just offer up some general advice to poor Wheaton College students who are considering... Uh, a business career or a political career. What, what are some load stars? What are some some things uh, that they have to never forget as they move forward in their career? Well, I list out a bunch of these at the end of the Yale speech, partly because when I when I went to the White House, I was looking at scrambling. What can I read? What can I find out? What's going to be like? I think the starting one is to say. Um, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your heart. Teaching at Oxford for 25 years, all kinds of young scholars from the U.S. particularly saying, how do you get to the White House? Well, you don't plan to get to the White House. And you wind up there. And in a, in a way, um, the only thing you can say is the common denominator is most of those people have done the best they could do in whatever they were doing to get there. That's a starting point. The other thing is that make sure you've uh, thought through right and wrong and focused on it. Kissinger often would say, uh, I'm operating on intellectual capital. And I'd say to myself, reflecting in, on the time, I operated on the kind of right and wrong, the, the kind of moral capital one yes. has built up. And right, you know, it's kind of a habit. It is actually thinking about it. It's knowing right from wrong, making sure that's more important. You asked that other question in your, in your paper. Uh, loyalty, yes, trust and loyalty are absolutely important, right. but they're trumped by right and wrong. So you will but always set that off against, is this right or wrong in the sense of a moral compass? And having thought about it and worked on it, and you think about great presidents and people in history, Lincoln, mm -hmm. Washington, mm -hmm. I mean, see, these were men who had really thought a lot about what's right and what's wrong, what's ethical, what's not, etc. But the, the, the having a compass to begin with, and I think my faith was absolutely a very critical part of my uh, survival in, in that and uh, let's say the capacity to cope with what was going on around me. There's a bunch, there's a list of things in mm -hmm. terms of saying to people to think seriously and prepare and the, the, uh, the, the kind of framework that you're operating, nothing's done for nothing. Remember everybody has this other, uh, this other uh, agenda. And it's always the trade-off between the individual pursuit of your own ambition versus what is really best for the organization or for the, the country in, in the, the biggest picture of all. The, the right from wrong framework is good. The other big thing is that it's very easily to be impacted by everybody around you. There's tremendous uh, group think in every administration, yes. in every government. I mean, it must be the same way in the Politburo and Kremlin and Beijing. I mean, there is a lot of that and the intrigue that's going on. And dear old 
Mr. McCloy's advice. Remember, there's going to be a lot of intrigue in a palace when you get that close to the throne, which is certainly the case of what's going on now. But I think the most important thing is think through, read. Probably history is probably what's happened before. Mm -hmm. What's happened mm -hmm. before is certainly a guide to saying, you know, this is the environment you're going to be in. It's not an environment, it's an environment in which very few people have actually experienced before. Uh, Dr. Davion, thank you for sharing your Thanks wisdom with us. Idea. You've been listening to a podcast from the Wheaton Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics. You can find us at wheaton.edu slash FTP.